Hello and welcome to this video. So I'm picking up directly where we left off in the previous video. We need to start digging in now to use this data frame we have here to start processing our data. So the first thing I'm going to do is make some space and zoom in a tiny little bit to close the files and hopefully you'll be able to see something in this one. I'll close the terminal. Okay, so first thing we're going to need is a loop through the data frame we made. So I'll type for index and row in dftrades.iterrows. What we need to do then, for each of the rows here, we have our start of trade and end. We need to get ourselves a subset of the five minute candle data. So we'll say m 5 date is equal to dfraw, where the dfraw.time is greater than or equal to the row.time and the dfraw.time is less than or equal to the row.trade end. What we can then do, just as a quick sanity check, is we can type print a formatted string with the row.time then we'll print the row dot entry and then make that two decimal places and the m5 underscore data dot shape. And also actually I'd like to see here whether it was a buy or sell and rather than see a one or a minus one and get a bit sick of that. Let's make ourselves a little bit of a function just in the cell above here. So we'll type def signal text and take in the signal. And then we'll say that if signal is equal to one return buy, l if signal is equal to minus one return sell, otherwise return none. Then inside our formatted string we can type signal text and row.signal. Before we actually run this and get loads of output I want to limit it and before we do that I want to reset the index of the data frame. So we'll have a null in here I think because we did a shift and also I want to reset this 0, 12 etc to 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. This helps us count things a bit easier. So I'm going to make a new cell just up here. Paste in these couple of lines here. So the first one just drops any NAs we have, and the second one just resets the index of the data frame. That's stuff you've seen before. And now here we can type if index is greater than 10, break. So if I give this a whirl, what you can see is we're looking like we're stepping through our trade. So we have a buy that's signaled at 112.81, and we get to analyze that by 623 five minute close timestamps, which is a good amount of data and quite a bit more than we did have in the previous simulation. So what we would like to do in here, obviously, is we need to process this M5 data. So up in the cell where we've written our signal text, we're going to write, you've probably guessed, a function. So I'm going to say def and process underscore M5 and take in the M5 data frame and the row. So now what we need to do is loop through this data frame and get all of the prices row by row. Now we've already seen ourselves do this with the for index row in data frame dot iter rows, except we're not going to do that here. I want to give you a, a tiny anecdote. I've done a project in recent months with a company which involve neural networks and a huge amount of data. Now the original exploration and test data to prepare data for the neural nets was using data frame iter rows and it became very, very slow. Changing this and iterating through the values in a particular column sped the code up by a factor of about 500. So if you ever end up with bottlenecks or you need to get your code faster, usually the first place to look is if you're using this iter rows. Now down here it doesn't really matter because we're only looping through 600 or so uh, rows, so there's not very many in there. But once you start getting into the 50, 100,000 rows or something like this, you can start having uh, really significant impacts on performance. So we know that we need the mid C, so the close price mid of the M5 data frame. So we're going to loop through that list of values, which is much, much faster. So we're going to say for price in M5 DF dot mid C dot values. And inside this loop is where we're going to do the management of this particular trade. And the first thing we need to be able to do in this trade is detect whether we have triggered a new trade or not. So that means whether we've gone above the signal level or below the signal level. So to do that, we need to write another function. So we're going to type def triggered and take in the direction of the trade, the current price and the signal price. And now some simple logic. We'll say if direction is equal to one, a buy, and the current price is greater than the signal price, return true. Else if the direction is minus one and the current price is less than the signal price, return true. Otherwise we return false. So we have a function now to detect the trigger. So the only thing to do now then is actually run this function and then we can print something to the screen to check uh, if everything's working. So we can write here then if triggered our row.signal, the price and row.entry is equal to true. Then we'll print a formatted string and say signal at and then the price to two decimal places, the row.entry to two decimal places and the row.signal to two decimal places. And then we can break for now. Okay, so executing all of that has defined our functions. I'm not sure how many spelling mistakes are in there. I'm about to find out. 
And what we can do now then is inside our loop, underneath the print, we can type process M5 and send in our M5 data and the row. So executing that then we can see that the first trade doesn't actually trigger at all. And if I remember correctly from our inside bore, but it doesn't just to confirm. No, nope, this one doesn't trigger, so that looks good. Then we can see that this one then does trigger the second one and then the third one doesn't trigger. Let me just check that as well. No, nope, that one doesn't trigger either, so that's good. Oh, that's looking quite good. So we can see that we've got the logic in there now to select our M5 prices that we need and then to loop through those prices and detect a signal of a trade. So in the upcoming videos, obviously, we're going to flesh out more and more the logic in here. So eventually we build up the full uh, simulation. So hopefully you've got an idea of where this is going now. Uh, thanks very much for watching. Thanks for all of the emails I've had one to one and also the really nice comments on the videos. It's really nice when people are interested. And uh, yeah, thanks very much for watching and see you in the next one.